Hopefully you all have your notebooks and your Bibles. Y'all got your Bibles? Can I see your Bibles? Who's got your Bibles here? You got you to bring the onion, the onion skin Bible that never fails, you know? Notebooks? How many note takers? You know, us preachers judge you for not taking notes. We do. We got judgmental eyes. Honestly, that's not true. I can't see past the stage right here because it's so cloudy in here. Those are kind of glories here. Or maybe it's a Chicano glory. I don't know. Could be, could be one. How y'all doing this morning? Well, it's an honor to be here today. Uh, I'm excited for this new series that Pastor Micah is starting. Uh, I want to give honor to Pastor Micah and Lindsay, phenomenal senior pastors that we have. You know, you don't understand the weight that they carry, I think, at times. But there are times where he'll text Joey and I, and he'll just say, hey, how's so-and-so doing? How's, how's this family doing? I don't remember this person's name, but they usually sit, because he even watches where you guys sit. So it's kind of cool. He goes, I was just thinking of them and just praying for them. So can we give it up for our senior pastors? We love them so much. And then we have another group of people here. You know, I know that you've seen Pastor Joey hobbling up here. Um, He's had, he's had a knee issue, and I know that we've been praying for Pastor Micah, but he and I talk all the time, and you have no idea how much it's paining him spiritually and emotionally to not be able to be up here and run around and do the spiritual calisthenics that Pastor Joey does. And so we need to pray for a complete healing over both of his knees and believe that God's going to... I believe that God's putting a word in you right now that when he come up here and like blow us away so yeah I love Pastor Joey and Valine and next to next to her is my beautiful amazing wife love you baby so much honor and respect for her you know we're doing this series and it's called the fight for family and many of you may know or you don't know that my wife and I I say this because it sounds cool that we you know run the counseling center but really she runs the counseling center because she's actually the counselor and so (laughs) You know, when we sit in counseling sessions, there's times where I'm just like, I'm looking at her, I'm like, man, you go, girl. Like, she's just functioning in her gift, and so I'm just thankful for a a church that allows that, number one. But my wife, who has a yes, and, you know, our spouses are very important to us. Uh, we're We're not here alone, and I think that's something that marriages need to recognize, that you're not in this alone. You are together, no matter how difficult it is, so. Y'all ready? Okay, so the title of my message this morning is Made in His Image. Made in His Image. Made in His Image, not made in social media image, not made in Twitter image or X, whatever it's called now. Not made in the far right image, not made in the far left image. We are made in His image. And I am a child of God. I am not a prodigal or a child of this world. And so my identity is not in this world. My identity is in Christ. I'm trying to help somebody this morning to let you know that you are not made in the image of what everybody says you are. You are made in the image of God. And we're going to dive into this a little bit deeper. And in order to do that, I need to go to Genesis chapter 1. And I want to touch on verses 26. I got a lot of word for you this morning. Is that all right if we we teach the word here? Because what we're going to share with you is right out of this book. I don't know if you know this or not, but, you know, from a denominational standpoint, where do we stand from Genesis to Revelation and everything in between? We don't skip pages, chapters, or verses, and we don't say what's pleasing to us. We We preach what's pleasing to the Father. And if you don't like it, don't take it up with me. Take it up with him. We're just going to speak the word and we're going to speak the truth and let the word interpret the word. Amen? Okay, so let's read the Word of God. Here's what it says in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 and 27. Let us, this is what God said, then God said, let us make human beings in our image. That word in the Hebrew is Adam, which means human being. It's not necessarily male. It's not necessarily what Adam's name was. He was called Adam because he was a human being. You have to remember that when God made him, he was all in one. He had everything he needed. He was all in one. God had to remove something from him to make Eve. We'll talk about that in a second. But that word means human being or mankind. To be like us. Here's what he says. They. So now you have to understand that God already had an image of you in his heart before you were actually made or created here. Before your mama and your daddy shared a milkshake, went to their first movie, went on their first date to Olive Garden or wherever it was. 
shopped at Mervyn's, because some of you don't even know what that is anymore. Mervyn's, you know what I'm saying? Like, maybe it was Kmart, because they're gone too, or even, for, for this sake of argument, Toys R Us. I hear they're making a comeback. Whatever it was, before they got together and out popped you, God already knew you. You were already in Him. He just decided that you would be here at this time in history of this world. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Verse 27, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God. I love how the Bible repeats itself. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. Okay, so now we're getting into a little bit of diversification. First and foremost, he's saying he created human beings. Then he gives them identity. I know it's going to be quiet in the house of God. But just like Pastor said on Sunday, there was only two categories that he gave us. And I know that the world's going to try to tell us that there's different categories. But male and female, he created them to reign over this world. And I love the word for male, it's zahar in the Hebrew, and the word for female is nekavi, which is close to naked, but we'll talk about that in a second. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7 and 9, or 7 through 9, in the New Living Translation, it says that then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. Now here's where we get our life. See, because before this, all we are is dirt. Before this, all we are is putty in the hand of God. Before this, God already created everything and then had an assignment to make out of what he created human beings. Now, I like this because as a chef, I am a chef. I know that's shocking to you, but I love to eat. Um, I love to cook, and, and I don't like bland cooking. I like to mix ingredients, right? Especially you Puerto Rican people. You like all the different flavors, you know? And Mexicans too, and Italians, I don't know whatever race you get, Chinese, whatever it is, you know, there's not just one simple ingredient. You got to mix a lot of ingredients together. And so that's essentially what the dirt was. God took all the ingredients that he created and he breathed the breath of life. Now that's the, de the, the, the determining factor between making a human being and creating a human being and making them actually in his image. Now he had the breath of life in them. So he, he breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils and the man became a living person. Spiritually, we were in heaven, we were in Christ, we were in God already. And it's not until we get the breath of life breathed in us that we become seen in the world. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and there he placed the man that he, that he had made. Verse 9. The Lord God made all the sorts of trees grow up in the garden. The trees were beautiful and they produced delicious fruit. And in the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you were not here last week, I would encourage you to go back onto our stream. Check out Pastor Glenn's message that he preached about redemption. He goes into great detail about these two trees. It's important that you hear that. Everything was made from what God created. You and I were made out of what God created. Jesus gives us this parable, and this is why I love this story of the dirt. Because Jesus gives a parable of dirt. He says there's this guy, he's walking through this field, and for the joy over a treasure that he sees in this field, he sells everything that he has to buy what? Not the treasure, to buy the field. Jesus is giving us a, an example from Genesis all the way now to Matthew and Luke and Mark to say that even in this time, he, he gave up everything. He sold everything that he had. He gave the best of himself for what? The dirt. Because there was treasure hidden in the dirt. And each and every one of you have a treasure hidden in you. Why? Because he created you in his image. And if you could grasp the concept that you are created in his image, then maybe you would stop seeing the reflection of your past, the reflection of what people say, the identity that people are trying to put on you, that the world's trying to put on you, and you would see your identity in Christ and say, you know what, I'm pretty hot and smoking right now. I'm a treasure to God. 
that he gave up everything for you and I. Now, I know some of you are visiting here today. I see a lot of hands go up when you said this is the first time in church and you could have went to several different places, but you chose us. And if you don't like it, what I would encourage you to do is come back next week. We'll give it another shot for you. We'll try to do better next week. <laughs> if you're looking for a perfect church, uh, I know where one's at. At least I've heard of it. The only problem is that you can't have a pulse to be there. It's called heaven. But I can tell you how to get there. And we're going to tell you how to get there every Sunday. But I don't know if you've noticed or not, we live in an imperfect world. With imperfect people. And if we're not careful, we'll take our imperfections and identify ourselves as our imperfections and miss the fact that God's put something in you that is fearfully and wonderfully made. He's put something in you that's so distinct and so different and so unique that you don't even have the same fingerprint as somebody else. Your DNA is different. You are a created being by God that is fearfully and wonderfully made. You are a treasure in His eyes. There's perfection in you if you can get past the identity that you've been lied to about. Everything God made was created from the dirt. And you and I have to fight for this treasure, this fight for the family. Well, how do I, how do I fight for that? Well, you've got to know who you are first. You, you have to start with your identity in Christ. Maybe you've lived a long period of time in your history, your credit report or whatever it is says that you're this, but I came here to give you good news. That you are now a new creation in Christ. That God can change you from the inside out. I'm not the same person that I was when I got saved in 2005. Thank God for that. But you have to start where you're at. And the first thing that we need to start with is understanding that there's a fight that's going on right now that you and I can't see. I love what one preacher said. If you could see the spiritual realm, you'd be curled up in a ball crying over the warfare that's going on over your life and everyone else's life around you. And you and I have to get into this fight. Well, how do I get into this fight? We walk by faith and not by sight. There are things that I'm going to have to declare and decree and believe in my life that the Word of God says, and it's a fight because everything that I see in this world is contrary to what the Word of God is speaking to me. And if I don't, if I don't pay attention, I'll be blinded by the things of this world and not, uh, not by the things of what God, or not have sight for the things that God says I am. Let me keep reading here. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15, it says that the Lord God placed the men in the man in the garden of Eden to tend it and to watch over it, to tend and watch over it. You and I have a responsibility to tend and watch over. Uh, your calling in life is not to gather as much as you can. Because I don't know if you know this or not, but, you know, when you pass away, your kids are probably going to put a lot of stuff in a garage sale or give it away that you paid a lot of money for. And you're thinking to yourself that, man, this is, this is a family heirloom. I'm going to keep this. And they're looking at that like, I'm not keeping that anywhere. To me, that's basura. For all my white folks, that's trash. Trash. The, the value that we place on things can be misdirected. The value that we, we think is important could be misconstrued. I, I think that we need to pay more attention to what our kids are watching. Pay more attention and attend to the things that our kids are doing. Why? Because the world is trying to fill them with darkness. And you and I need to watch over it. We need to tend it. We need to make sure that they're getting the word of God. We need to make sure that they understand that, that this is a way, this is the truth, and this is the life. There's no other way to heaven but Jesus. You and I have a responsibility to watch over and to tend. There's a generation of children in our children's facility right now that are getting the gospel. There's kids over there speaking and praying in tongues and praying for their kids and their friends to be delivered. What happens when they come in here? That's why it's important that we have to build the house. We have to build the kingdom together. And I'm not saying that the stuff that you have is bad. But does the stuff have you? We need to build the kingdom of God. I think we spend so much time 
on our own things and miss the assignment that God initially gave us. Don't disqualify yourself from your past. Don't look at your past to say, "Mm, I'm not worthy enough to talk like he talks or preach like he preaches. You know, you will reach people that I will never see. You are the living witness that they will see. You are the gospel of Jesus Christ that they will see. And so you have to look at yourself differently to say, okay, I may not be that person or this person, but I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And I do have to watch over and I have to tend to what my friends see, what my family sees, what my coworkers see. It is a responsibility that I have to show the gospel of Christ to them. And if necessary, use words. Did we gather enough to ensure that our children are following the truth? Or did we gather enough to rid ourselves of the guilt of the poverty that we grew up in? Our responsibility is to not keep gathering and tend over what we gather. Our responsibility is to watch over and protect and expand the gospel of Jesus Christ. That you and I are to be a living witness to this world. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18 and 19 says that the Lord God said it's not good for a man to be alone still going through this process of how the family was created. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and the birds of the sky. And he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. I like what one comedian said. He started off so strong. Hippopotamus, giraffe, platypus. (laughs) At some point in time, you probably just got a little tired. like cat. Dog, fly, bee, gnat, flea. But Adam didn't find anything that fit his fancy. He didn't find anything that God brought to him that was equal to be co with him. So in Genesis chapter 2 and 21 and 22, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into deep sleep. And while the man slept, the Lord took out one of his ribs, one of the man's ribs, and closed the opening. And then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and then he brought the rib to the man. He brought her to the man. That's why men love ribs so much. (laughs) Yum, yum. I think it's interesting that God didn't create or rather make Eve out of dirt. He made Eve from the man. And as one preacher said, it wasn't from the head, it wasn't from his foot, it was from his side. They reign over earth. I think it's an equal partnership. And in fact, in Ephesians, it tells us to to that we should mutually respect one another, mutually honor and mutually submit. Depending on the translation you read, we submit to one another. I think this relationship that God's given us It's not for us to be dictators. We only have one dictator, and his name is God. His name is Jesus, and he's a loving dictator at that. God didn't call us to dominate our family. God called us to lead our family, men. So when we look at this, and they say that they're leading, not dominating, a loving man is easy to follow. I would rather be followed in love than followed by fear. It's easy to follow because of love. It's very difficult to follow because you're afraid. God doesn't even force us to do that. He loves us in our current condition. You are here today, and he accepts you just the way you are. But I got good news for you. He loves you too much to keep you that way. So there's going to be some changes that have to be made in not only your life, but in your family. And it is a fight that you and I are going to have to engage in, not just on the weekend on a Sunday, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I have to be the love of Christ to my family all days of the week, not just when it suits me. We need to be the loving family that leads our wife, that loves our wife, that loves our children. We need to teach our daughters how a woman should be treated. I feel sorry for my son-in-law because I made it real difficult because she thinks she's still a princess. Praise God. But your daughters need to know their worth. 
Because I can assure you there's a world out there that would like to devalue her. There's a world out there that would like to devalue your son, devalue, to devalue your sons and daughters and make them think less of themselves when reality is, is that you're the apple of his eye. That God loves you so much that he gave his only son. The gift that he gave was a price that you and I could not pay. So we cannot devalue our children or look at it less. You and I as men and women, as families, we need to fight this fight of faith for our families and engage in this battle against what the world is trying to teach them. And with that, we have to understand that men and women are different by design. Now that may seem elementary to you, but I want to teach you a little something today about how stereotypically, mostly, God created everything from the ground except Eve, right? Eve did not wake up to a job. Eve woke up to a relationship. She didn't wake up to a job. Adam's job was to go around, name everything, tend everything, and man, my man was working, 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 working. Eve didn't wake up to that. She woke up to a relationship. You ever see women talk to each other? The way that they engage, and they look into each other's eyes. It's almost as they can read each other's minds. And then you look at a man and a woman talk and you can see the confusion on their faces at times. <laughs> what do you want, woman? <laughs> Just tell me what you want. And she's over here talking about how she feels. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't understand how you feel. Just say what you need and what you want. I can fix it, I promise. <laughs> tell me what you want. And repeat it three times. <laughs> but women have this ability to communicate different than men. I remember one time my wife and I were watching TV in our bedroom, and we lived in Ripon at the time, at the time and, and we were all the way on this side of the house, and the kids had a room way on the other side of the house. And at this age, the kids learned that they couldn't fight out loud. They had to be sneaky about how they fought. And we're watching a movie, and I don't remember what the movie was, but I know that the TV was loud in our room, and all of a sudden my wife was like, her ear was like, <laughs> and she goes, oh, no. And I said, what? She goes, I'll be back. The well, next thing I know, I hear weeping and gnashing of teeth in the back. I'm like, what is happening? <laughs> she comes back, a little huffy puffy, and she goes, they thought they were going to be able to fight and quiet. I heard them the whole time. I'm like, heard what? I was so confused. Like, what did you hear? I didn't hear any of that. You ever talk to a woman and, like, they could be talking to you and hear six other conversations going on at the same time? <laughs> Not a man. No, sir. No, ma'am. I'm locked into this conversation, and as soon as I'm distracted, I want, 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 want. We're different by design. Man was created, and the first thing that God gave him was a job. He did a lot of watching and attending to the job. His focus was different. The reason why this happens, it happens in the womb. When a man is in the womb, there's this thing called a testosterone bath that literally separates the right and the left side of his brain. That does not happen to a woman. So there are certain neurons and certain capabilities that a woman has. They can actually use both sides of their brain at the same time. Not a man. Doesn't mean that we don't use both sides of our brains. It's just very difficult for us to focus on one side or the other at the same time. This is how God's designed it. You know why? Because it allows us as men to compartmentalize. I can be in a, in a meeting and it could be a very tough meeting about finances, or it could be a tough meeting about disciplinary action that we have to do, or maybe it's a meeting where we got to make some decisions on an event that's coming up, and there could be a lot of high stress in that meeting, and I can leave that meeting and go into another meeting where we're celebrating somebody's birthday, and I'm loving on that person, and it's just a great day, and leave that meeting and go to a meeting with my kids and not even think about the other meetings that I was in. Not a woman. That's not happening at all. Everything is connected to everything. You can't talk about the kids without talking about the money, without talking about work, without talking about the family, the in-laws, the outlaws, the ex-laws. It's all connected. It's just a big ball of yarn. 
There's books written about this stuff. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Men are, are, are waffles and women are spaghetti. <laughs> Literally books written about this stuff. This is nothing new. But it amazes me how we expect men to act and be like women and women to act and be like men. And it happens more often in marriages and in relationships. You know, dating was really easy, but then all of a sudden when the blinders came off and you got married and you started seeing their flaws, like he left to go do something in the kitchen and forgot what he was doing in the kitchen and had to come back and get more instruction. What was I leaving? Why, why did I leave? He compartmentalized the whole thing. My wife's favorite is I open up the fridge Where's the mustard at? It's right in front of you. No, it's not. It's not in here at all. And her favorite pastime is to walk right next to me and grab it. No. There it is. There it is. I knew I could find it. They did studies on men and women. And they attached these probes on their head. Multiple probes all over the place. And for a woman, it was like a 7.4 earthquake. Just dancing up there. For a man, boop. Boop, boop. Okay? When a man says to you and you ask him the question, what are you thinking about? And he says, he ain't lying. Telling you the God's honest truth, that's gospel. He's thinking of nothing. Absolutely impossible for women. Impossible. And you're laughing because you know that it's true. But this is the stuff you fight over. Into the kitchen I go. The differences that God's given us are not to be fought for or fought about. We need to fight to ensure that we remain different, but in community and in unity. Men are supposed to go first. There's, I, I love the fact that God's created order and structure for the home. Men are to lead, to be the example. I guess the best example that you could say would be found in Ephesians chapter 5. I don't have the scripture. But men need to sacrifice first. Men are the ones, our marriage is supposed to be an example of Christ in the church. And if it's an example of Christ in the church, well, who sacrificed first? Jesus. And so the man needs to be the one that sacrifices first. Not always easy. Because in spite of wanting to, there's also a sinful nature in us that gets a little selfish at times. But you know the difference between a person who's sacrificing and a person who has to sacrifice. Huge difference. And these are the things that we fight over. These are the gender differences that get us confused. Or at least should be the only gender differences that get us confused. <clears throat> a man will never be as nurturing as a woman. It's true. When men see their child fall, it's like, I'll get up and dust them off. It's okay. When a woman sees her child fall, oh, my God. <laughs> Call 911. He's fine. It's just grass. <laughs> dust him off a little bit. He's got dirt in his mouth. He was made from dirt. He's fine. <laughs> Leave him alone. <laughs> We're different by design. You want to see a man go through depression? Let him lose a job. You want to see a woman go through depression? Let her lose a relationship. We're different by design. It's not that the relationship doesn't affect us as men the same or different or, or the same. It does, it does affect us. But that's not where our focus is at all the time. Most marriages will struggle over, struggle over the fact that he's always focused on his work. I want to spend time with him. 
And he's saying, well, I want to spend time with you too, and the way that I spend time with you is I provide. And so we fight for these differences, but we're not fighting the good fight of faith, and we're fighting against the family instead of fighting for the family. And if we were to recognize, now there has to be balance. Understand there has to be balance. But my nurturing aspect is not the same as my wife's nurturing aspect. And for her to expect me to be her girlfriend is an unrealistic expectation. And for me to expect her to be like my best bro is an unrealistic expectation. Marriages should not be treated like that. It is a sanctified union between a man and a woman that should be cherished. She is my equal. She is my heir. We're in this together. Which now means that I have to have better communication and community with my wife. So I have to be able to talk about things that are difficult to talk about. So I'm not going to absolve any man in here who doesn't want to talk. Grunting is not a form of communication. Hey, how was your day? (laughs) She needs to know. How was your day? Communication is important. I've had to fight the urge of disconnecting and, and checking out in conversations. Why? Because it happens. I, I compartmentalize. I, I, I could, my head could be somewhere else in that moment. One of the things that my wife and I argue about to this day is being present. It is a battle that I fight. When I want to check out, I scroll. When I want to check out, I just drift away into nothingness and think about nothing. But that doesn't help the family dynamic. So I have to learn to re-engage in the fight that's right and stop fighting for my own needs and fighting for my own feelings and my own emotions. I'm not in this alone. We are in this together. Vice versa. My wife has needs to communicate. I also have needs to communicate. We just communicate differently. So she has to understand at some point in the conversation you're going to start sounding like Charlie Brown's teacher. It's not intentional, but at some point it's just going to go wah, 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 wah. You have to know when to engage in a conversation and when not to. This is why God's giving you discernment. You ever see a woman and they're like, you know, there's just something off about that person? God's given them great discernment. They're like, mm, there's something not right about that. Pastor Glenn said it last week that the man is the head and the woman's the neck. Turn thy attention to that. Not right. We have to work together. I guess the best way to explain it would be understanding that you are on the same battlefield, fighting the same battle with different perspectives of the battle. I'm on the battlefield and I'm looking at this side of the battlefield and I'm seeing all the things that I got to do, all the things that we need to conquer and all this stuff. And she's on this side of the battlefield seeing all the things that are coming against the marriage, all the things that are coming against the family. You know, I used to love when we would do marriage counseling with couples before we had this uh, assessment that we used because men and women would come in there and, you know, she was like, well, you know, over the last nine months, I've just been feeling like we've been disconnected. And he's like, everything was fine two weeks ago. I don't know what's wrong. Different perspectives. He's compartmentalized everything and everything is connected to everything. Who's right and who's wrong? Single people, raise your hand. I know this crowd over here all over. Okay, look around quick, quick. Take a look, take a peek. Your options are fading quick. Got HYA tonight. You young adults. <laughs> This is not a message you check out, and this is one you check into because you're eventually going to be married. You're eventually want to, going to have a relationship, and if you don't understand the gender differences now, you are fearfully and wonderfully made by God, by design, then you will fight the wrong fight. I'll never forget one time I was in the back, standing there, and, and a guy comes walking in, and he's looking confused, as most men, just staring around, and I, I said, Can I help you? He goes, I'm trying to find my wife. I said, do you have one or do you need one? Because I got options. I can help with both. It's the beauty of a big church. (laughs) Take resumes and help some people out, you know? We just think different. We just think different. I like fun country. My wife loves peace and perfection. I think differently. She thinks differently. But these things have to work together. 
when I'm on the battlefield and I'm seeing all the things that we have to conquer and she's on the battlefield seeing all the things that we need to love, I can't check out on what she sees. I have to engage in what she sees. And every now and again, I got to turn things around and look the direction that she's looking in and vice versa. You will manage your each other's stress and have better communication when you see it from each other's perspective and not as a battle with each other. Men have the ability to compartmentalize, but women have the ability to connect. Both are needed. Both are absolutely needed. And then finally, we need to stop the abuse. Eliminating the abuse. How do we do that? When we embrace our design, we eliminate abuse. What does the word abuse mean? Abnormal use. Abnormal use. This that I'm holding in my hand is a microphone. Duh. But I could also use this as a hammer if I wanted to. Because it might hammer some stuff in that I need to. But that would be abnormal use, which is abuse. Right? Okay, so when you expect a man to be like a woman... That's abnormal use. And vice versa, when you expect a woman to respond or be like a man, that is abnormal use. They are different by design. We have to tend to the things that God's given us to watch over. We have to fight for a biblical family and not each other and not our differences. You and I have to fight for the unity. We have to fight for communication. We should not be fighting about unity or about communication. We should be fighting for it. You need to fight for your role, not fight your spouse for your role, because you fighting for your role is a personal fight. I want to be the best husband that I can be, and I fail at it sometimes miserably. I want to be the best leader that I can be, but I often fail at it sometimes miserably. I'm not perfect. Nobody in here is perfect. However, the fight remains the same. I am striving to be the best that God's created me to be, and by his stripes and by his strength, I'm going to succeed in those areas of my life. But I'm not fighting against my wife or anybody else in this world for that matter for the role and the confidence that God's given me. A loving relationship should be a man and a woman conversing over the things that are needed and processing things together. And in the order of the family, somebody has to be the one to make the decision when we're in an impasse. And hopefully you make the right decision. But it shouldn't be a battle for that. You and I should be fighting for bigger and greater things, like our families, our children, our future children that we don't have yet. All the things of this earth are going to fade away. One day it's all going to be wrapped up and it's going to be gone. And as I said before, having stuff is okay. I believe that you should have fun. I certainly do not want a church that is boring. I like a church that's fun. I like a church that's mixed with color, great diversity, I like to have fun. I told the Lord when I first got saved that if I come to this church and it's a fuddy-duddy church, I'm out. I'm back. I'm going back to what I was doing because that was more fun. But I've been blessed with the experience to go to India and preach the gospel and see lives change and transform and see miracle, miraculous healings happen. I've been blessed to see people at this altar get delivered and healed and set free. I've been blessed to see demons cast it out. So that's better than any 3D IMAX movie I've ever seen. To see somebody get set free from a demonic spirit. I have, I have been blessed to see lives and marriages restored. I've been blessed to see families come back together. Divorces gotten rid of. I've been blessed to see God do amazing things that the world could never offer. It was so much more fun to experience. And that's the fight that we have to keep fighting for. See, you may not have all those experiences, but you can start. You can go in your workplace and be a different person tomorrow. I'll never forget when we first got saved. Uh, we were, you know, we, we kind of secluded ourselves for about nine months because there was a lot. I mean, you know, we, were, we, were, we had Dish Network, and so at that time you could program what channels you wanted on at night. And so I would jump around from all these different preachers, and it would be TBN, Daystar, and all these different things, and it would just play through the night. And, I, you know, I got to the point where I was like, okay, God, this is starting to get boring. And I want to have some fun. And if it's going to be like this, then I'm going to go back. And the Lord said, no, don't, don't go back. 
Just experience me in the fullness and you'll, you'll start to have more fun. And so I started seeing all these things. My, eyes, my spiritual eyes were open to, to different things. And I remember we got an invitation to go to uh, a cousin's house for a party. And I told my wife, I said, no, nah. I said, I mean, we shouldn't go. They're going to be drinking and smoking and all this other stuff, you know, heathens, you know. Like, all of a sudden now I'm judgmental. Like, <laughs> had a $1,500 a week meth habit, now I'm judgmental. You know, like, <laughs> the audacity, right? But now I'm set free and delivered, and I don't want to hang out with those folks. And I heard the Lord say, oh, they're too good? you're too good for them now? Is that what I did? He goes, can you not go back and be the light? I told my wife, I said, well, I think we need to go. And she's like, really? I said, yeah, let's go. So we went, and they were doing them, and we were doing us. Having a good old time, laughing. I mean, we chopped it up all the time. And, and I'll never forget, at the end of the night, you know, we, we pecked up our stuff, and we left, and... It was, it was a good night. It was a really fun night. The next morning, we get a phone call from one of my wife's cousins. And she says, hey, are you guys home? And I said, yeah, yeah, come on over. And uh, he sits in our backyard, and he says, I don't know what you guys have, but I want it. <laughs> we were able to lead him to the Lord. We were able to share our testimony with him, and to this day, he's serving the Lord. You see, when you fight the right fight, and you engage in the right fight, you're going to start to see things change in your family. Were we perfect? No. But we're perfect in his eyes. Perfect to be used by him. The environment that God wants to put you in is the right environment that God wants you in. Can you be the light? Can you fight for that? Can you fight to see your family saved? Can you fight to see your kids saved? Can you fight to see your, your neighbor saved? Can you fight to keep your, see your co-workers co saved? Can you just give them enough Jesus that points to him and not to you? It may seem very difficult, but as I close, here's the thing that I want to leave you with. It's a choice. It's a choice that you and I have to make. So stand to your feet. It's a choice. I didn't have time to put it on the screens, but there's a choice that Joshua gives to each and every one of the Israelites as they came into their promised land. And the choice was very simple. He said, you know, look, you've seen God do all these great things. Battles that we've won. Cities destroyed. We marched around Jericho. The walls fell down when we shouted. Of all the things that you've seen God do, it amazes me how we disqualify ourselves and try to go the opposite direction. Some of you may be thinking to yourself, well, I, I've not seen demons cast out or people's lives change, or, but you've seen miracles in your own life. Some of you shouldn't even be here today. The devil tried to take you out a long time ago. So Joshua is talking to the people and he tells them, he goes, look, Y'all got some decisions to make. Again, this is the RJV version. It's my how I interpret the Bible. It says, the decision you need to make is this. You think that serving the God of Israel is evil? Don't serve him. Then serve the gods of these people that you've been conquering. See how that works out for you. But you got to make a choice. You're either going to serve the God of Israel or you're going to serve these gods. There's no halfway. There's no half step in. There's no other decision. It's either one or the other. And that is a decision that you and I have today. I'm either going to serve God or I am not. There's no in between. And then he makes a statement. He goes, you know, you got to make this choice. You've seen everything. You've seen everything I've seen. So choose this day who you're going to worship. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Now, I don't do this often, but I think it's a moment of reverence that each and every one of us need because I think it's time for us to make some choices. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, maybe you've been making some wrong choices. 
Maybe you've not been the example of a father that you should have been. Maybe you've not been the example of a mother or a wife that you should have been. Or maybe you've not been an example of a child of God that you should have been, could have been. Maybe you feel like today you're just a hypocrite because you know that when you leave here today, you're probably going to go back and do whatever it is that you were doing. But you're in good company. And I know a God who can change you. He can make you a new creation. He can turn everything around in your life. But you still got to make a choice. So the first thing that I want to do is, is I, want, I want to know if you've made a choice for Jesus. Do you know that he is your Lord and Savior? Or is he just some guy hanging around your neck? Do you know him as your Lord and Savior? Or is he just some guy that you reach out to when you got a problem? He's not your on-time God or your all-time God. He's your 911 God. You call him whenever there's an emergency. If that's you and you want to turn things around today, I want you to make that choice by lifting your hand and say, you know what, today's the day that I'm going to give my heart to Jesus. All across this room, lift your hand really high. If you're making that choice today, lift your hand really high so I can see it. Thank you. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, with the same boldness you lifted your hand, come up to the altar. Our prayer team's going to come up. Come on up here. Come on up here. No shame, no guilt, no condemnation. Come on up here. You made that choice today. Come on up here. Come on, church. Give it up for them. They're coming from all over the place. It's the greatest choice you could have made. Now here's my encouragement to you. This isn't a one-time decision. You need to know that. Because tomorrow you're going to have an opportunity to serve another God. Maybe it's the God of your own opinion. Maybe it's the God of your past. But you're going to have to carry your cross daily. And here's the good news that I have for each and every one of you there to hear. We're going to walk side by side with you the whole entire way. If you connect to us, I promise we'll connect with you. We have discipleship classes. We have age groups. We have age classes that we want to get you connected. Our prayer team can give you that information. But it's not a one-time choice. You're going to have to choose this life daily. I don't know what your past or your history is like. But today we're writing a new history. Amen? Today we're going to write a new history. Now, for the rest of you in this room, this is my last altar call. Maybe you haven't been fighting the right fight. Maybe you need to forgive your spouse. I know that that's tough. Because in your mind, it justifies the behavior. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is, is I'm not going to live with the pain that it's causing me. I'm going to release you to God. And I'm going to trust God with you. But I can't harbor this unforgiveness anymore. Forgiving is releasing. Forgiving is saying, okay, God, I can't deal with this, but I know that you can. And in the process, I need you to help me with my pain and my emotions. When you give like that, the reciprocation is astounding. Because I've seen marriages healed when you put down the battle axe towards each other and pick up the sword of faith and fight the fight for your family. So you do have to release it. Release the anger. Release the pain. And forgive. But that's a choice. So if that's you, lift your hands all across. You need to forgive somebody. Maybe it's not your spouse. Maybe it's a family member or something. Remember Pastor Glenn shared a story that he had a person had to forgive a Mustang because he got hit by a Mustang and it was the Mustang that caused him to lose his job. I don't know what you need to forgive, but lift your hand. You got something or someone you need to forgive, lift it up really high. Now all together lift up both hands because we're going to release it today. 
Pray this prayer with me, will you, church? And you down here. Heavenly Father, I need your forgiveness. I don't want to hold on to the wrongs, the records of wrongs, and the pain that I have received or have caused. I'm asking that you would release me from this burden and this debt. I choose to forgive just as you've forgiven me. Now, Jesus, I need you to come into my life. Encourage me. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your presence. And remind me that I'm yours. I want to be an example to not just my family, but my friends, my coworkers, and to this world. I choose today to release and hold on to only you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.